Uh, here's the first question. Is there any shift going on in the police academies as it relates to the training officers in light of 21st century policing? Absolutely. Excellent question. Who, who, who had that question? That's an excellent one. Well, that's dangerous. Yeah. You're going to make excellent people question. say who asked. Here, here's what's happening uh, nationally as it relates to training academies. Uh, one, and I mentioned you know, the training of implicit bias. Number two, uh, is scenario-based training where we, we, we actually go through it. We go through actual live scenarios, talking, communicating. De-escalation training is key and critical. Uh, ability to communicate and de-escalate in tense situations, including people with uh, uh, mental health issues. Uh, the, the other issue that's, that's really being talked about in, in academies, and I touched on that a bit, and that is understanding procedural justice and its implications. There are others, but those are the hot ones. This is actually my own question, but just kind of follow up with that. So you talked about us taking, you know, starting with I and personal responsibility. And I think sometimes when we hear this, or at least when I hear this, it can be easy to be like, well, that's the police's job, right? So what would you say to those of us who are not police officers, which is probably the vast majority, how should we be part of this conversation in a way that's beneficial and helpful in totally our own community? Um, when, when I conveyed that story uh, of um, the task force and everyone was saying, I don't know how this happened, it's the judge, it's just, you, you know, part of, part of what I had was a lonely feeling. I'm going, please, it'd be great to be able to, to, to do what everyone else did in the, in the, in the criminal justice system. Uh, I, go, I go back to this one, that, that, that Covey, uh, circle of concerns, circle of uh, influence. Right next to you, in your circle, you can impact people. You can impact this issue. Uh, there, there, and many of you probably do, uh, tutor someone, help get someone uh, to work, um, talk about the issues from the standpoint of the people that are directly impacted by it. Sometimes, you know, citizens and politicians and uh, people that provide service, they think they know the answer, but a lot of times we don't. I'll give you just one quick example. I work for the, the, the Urban League uh, of Madison. And you know, our response was, we got to get people a job. got to get people a job. got to get them trained. We were training people for four hours, eight hours. If you are working and trying to work, you can't train for eight hours. But we didn't get that connection until we asked them directly. So our, 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 we had to do more on the job training. So people could work and do that, but until you ask them. If you, to, if you can tutor someone, that is so important. I, I just, I can't, I, I, and, and I know there's a lot of uh, debate out there on, you know, can you raise the standards? Can you reduce the achievement gap? What I saw uh, is kids, for those that are teachers, they need someone, an adult that cares. Uh, what, what you can't argue with is that those kids that get tutored and they make that connection, their attendance improves. And this is something that you have within your control. So. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, this is good. OK. What case, if any, infuriated you most over social racial injustice happening here in Madison? What were, what were some things that maybe were frustrating? Now, you know, it's been, you know, I was here for 30 years. <laughs> so, so we have 15 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Here, here's one that in, in, in infuriates me and it bothers me to this day, and it's, um, it's, it's kind of a little different. Um, uh, for those that were around um, years ago, you, you may recall uh, that horrific situation where we had uh, a family of kids, it was about four or five kids, and it was actually in the town of Madison that that burned up in that fire. It was just a, just a horrific thing. What has bothered me about that, uh, it's very rare to lose five, four or five kids, I think it was four or five, in a fire in anywhere. What bothers me about that is that there's not a memorial for those kids. It, it, just, it just seems so insensitive to me that, that we as a, as a you know, as a Madison or Dane County, that we did not do a memorial or recognize, you know, that we lost some of our, 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 our treasure and just a horrific, horrific thing. And there were some racial overtones around that particular situation. 
Uh, there were some mistakes made by our department uh, related to it, even though we were not in a town of Madison. But what really bothers me that, that sticks with me to this day is that you, you, you can you drive past there, you wouldn't even know it. And, and we have to recognize those kind of things. So That's good. Kara, is there another one we can do on Twitter? Yeah, go to another written one? Okay, great. Okay, so I th thank you. So here's a question that I think it's a little raw, but it's, uh, I think, probably on many people's minds. So it's, and it's a little longer. So let me just read this. Uh, recent books like The New Jim Crow and Pulled Over make it clear that the system that police are taught is already biased against African Americans. In addition, police officers are taught to confront and subdue, which is at least uh, in part behind the shooting of young African American. Um, a little bit of this is hard to read. Um, so what steps are you recommending to eliminate bias and teach uh, police officers differently? Okay. A, a, cu a couple of things. That's why I spent, spent you know, last two or three years going across the country um, uh, teaching bias, implicit bias. Uh, how, how, how do you apply that within the, uh, the policing field? Uh, not only recognizing your own implicit bias, but how do you build a comprehensive plan within your department to deal with the implicit bias? Because it's not just, you know, recognizing uh, and, and minimizing the impact of your implicit bias. It, implicit bias, it, it filters into recruitment, hiring, policies, procedures, where you focus your officers, how you focus your officers. So, so, so that's one. You know, I, I, you know I, I, I didn't retire on this one. You know, I, I've, I've been to, to the hot spots, Al Albuquerque, Seattle, talk, talking about that. So that, that's one thing that I, I, I have personally uh, uh, committed, committed to doing. Um, where I, I think we, we need to go with this is that I've, I've looked in the eyes of a number, thousands of police officers doing this, and, and, and three things have, have occurred to me with it. One is if you personally are not one that believes in constant improvement or asking yourself, kind of um, retrospectively, how could I improve that situation? W was I being biased? Uh, and I don't mean just from an officer standpoint, I mean asking yourself this question from the beat officer all the way up to the chief of police. Because what, what we tend to forget is we focus on that, that, that beat cop, but some of the things that we put them in situations where they're not the ones that are being biased it's the operational policies and procedures that are being biased. And, and we have to help, help people to know that. Could, could you read some more? Because I, 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 sure. there was something else in there that I think I've. Uh, it says, in addition, police officers are taught to confront and subdue, which is at least part of what's behind uh, the shooting of young African Americans. That oh. was kind of the. Here's something that, that I, would ask, I would ask you to do. Uh, something has just happened uh, in this country regarding use of force that I never thought that I would see. If you get online and you Google, they're called 30 principles. Some of them are con controversial, but they're, 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 they're 30 principles of use of force. The first principle starts with recognizing and honoring the sanctity of life. Third principle get, gets into something that's really technical, so really a police thing, and that's grand versus counter. But the, the third one is, it, it talks about proportionality and how we see force. Now, I, I, I don't personally agree with every word of these, but we are starting to really ask ourselves in reforming policing some very profound questions about how we exercise our use of force. Everything from, this, this, is, just, this is just an example. When I'm on the line and I'm shooting, uh, practicing my shooting, I would stand on the line and then come up and shoot. Which is, which is very, very static. That's why some of the training now talks about, you know, the scenario-based training, talking, de-escalating, moving around. If you're on the line and you're drawing a line and you're shooting use, use of force, you've already mentally drawn a line and you're looking for, in your mind, when do you exercise force as opposed to how do I, in a very fluid, dynamic situation, de-escalate this and move around and talk. So there's, there's just a lot going on, but I would encourage you to take a look at those because I, I never thought during my career that I would see questions being raised as they are right now. That's helpful. Mm -hmm.
All right, next one. How do police pursue collaboration with communities that don't trust them or their methods? That's good. <laughs> oh. We're bringing it, man. Wow, yeah. man, I'm telling you. Do you feel welcomed right now? Do you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is good. Safe place, everybody. You so. know, I, I, if, if, if you can go um, to Ferguson right in the heat, right, right when the protests are going on, right around that time, that's where I was. Um, we did this implicit bias training in, Fer in, in Ferguson. I had community members and the top, the, the law enforcement officials from St. Louis County, um, excuse me, Ferguson, and they were, they were all in the room. You can imagine when we started, this was very tense. I mean, this was, this was, this, I mean, you, you got um, Urban League, you got, you got uh, Black Lives, you got, you, you name it, they're in the room, and this, this is very tense. Um, that first day was tense. The second day, when we started having the discussion about bias and that implicit bias is a human thing, and that all people have biases. And it's not just police officers, it's citizens as well. They started to see each other from each other's perspective. And, and I think if we can do more of that, we don't do enough of training together. In New York, this is actually, this is, this is actually what happened when I was in New York. They had citizens uh, go to the training, uh, NYPD's training. They had a group of citizens that went, and they followed them around going to their training. And they came back, and this is what they shared. They asked, why is it that police officers, when, they, when they're training, they always do worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. So as opposed to it being just a routine traffic stop where you're going to give someone a ticket and move on, oh, oh no, <laughs> you, know, you're, you know, where's the gun? Where's it? You know. And I thought that was a, a fascinating observation. So we need, I'm one of those that will advocate, we need more connection. We have to look for ways to bring citizens in. Um, and, and, and too much within um, our profession, we have design walls. Uh, go into, uh, you know, I go into a lot of police departments all over the United States. Go into some of them. There's the plexiglass all over. There's cages all over. And everybody behind there got guns. I mean, you, you think about that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, honestly, think about it. I mean, we, we, it, it, we, we wall, wall them off. Um, it, it, it's just, I, I don't know. I'm not as, so we've got to look at ourselves and figure out ways that we can be intentional about bringing community in. So it's great. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one or two more. Do you have one more there? Or you're running it up. Wow. You guys, this is Kara, by the way. So, so yeah, let's give Kara a hand. <laughs> it's another really long one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. While the prosecutors deal with the with who the police send them, the police uh, aren't the end of the line. The police get the rest of. Oh man, Kara, did you read this ahead of time? I can't quit. I'm so sorry, guys. I can't quite make it out. I'm going to, well, there's two other ones I'm just going to kind of put together, okay? Because we're about out of time anyways. Um, but it was, I'm sure it was a great question. <laughs> okay? Let's just assume. Uh, so there's a couple in here I'm just going to kind of mash up. But essentially it's this, and I, I actually I hope this is a good question to end on. So this is directed back out at us because I don't want to let us off too easy because it's easy to talk about what the police should do and, you know, how to do it better. Um, in your observation, here in Madison and Dane County, you talked a little bit about, you know, the strength of a city is how well it cares for the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you just to, you know, just be honest with us. How well do you think we do as a city, and how can the church be part of better caring for the most vulnerable? Oh, wow. um, here, here's where, if you talk to a, a, a police officer, and this is where I think we've got to make this, this, this connection. There's a young man here. His name is Will Green. You know, he, if you went to his breakout session, he, well, Will Green. I asked police officers, my, my neighborhood officers, you know, what, what really works uh, in terms of when you're out there and you're, you're dealing with young people, gangs, et cetera, what, what, what really works? And they mentioned Operation Fresh Start. They mentioned Will Green. They mentioned a couple of other things. I says, well, why? Why, does, why do they work? 
He said, because they are out there when we're out there. Okay? They have real-time responses. Police officers get blamed, and we should, take, we should take that, but they get blamed for overusing one of the responses, and that is taking a kid to jail. But, but a, a police officer dealing with a, a group of kids that are disturbing at 2 o'clock in the morning, we need real-time alternatives. We talk about alternatives, but you can't have the alternative from 8 to 4. You know, real-time alternative, if, if a kid is clowning in a classroom, we need somewhere to take that kid and, and, and be able to uh, really divert from the criminal justice system. But it, it can't be the way that we're doing it now. It, it is always, everybody's got their time, it's 9 to 5, 8 to 4. It, it, it doesn't work that way. So what, what can we do? We, we need to be thinking about how we can support a police officer that has taken someone struggling with a mental illness that really wants that person to get help, but jail is the only place, real time. We need to think about when the cops are called into a classroom, and it's a, it's a struggle between are they fighting or is this a disturbance? But that teacher can't deal with the kid being in there disturbing. Where do you take that kid real time that's not overusing the criminal justice system? We need the community to come in and push that issue. Real time. So can, can we create more drop-in shelters? Can we, can we advocate for um, emergency rooms to have the support and help uh, when someone is struggling with a mental illness as opposed to going over there? We need those things real time. Um, so I, I hope that that answered your question. While I'm up here, uh, close it. thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Really, I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Door Creek because they have collaborated with us. I've been here before. And the last thing I'll say, God bless you. <laughs> <All right. laughs>